Hello and welcome to In Their 20s. This is the podcast with the best advice. As always, I'm your host, Landon Campbell. Before we introduce this week's guest, I would like to acknowledge the recent developments in the Ukraine and express my hopes and prayers for the safety of everybody involved. Today, we are speaking with Guy Kawasaki, who is the chief evangelist of Canva, which is an online graphics design service. Guy was also one of the first Apple employees originally responsible for marketing their Macintosh computers back in 1984. You know, there's a famous slogan that exists about Guy Kawasaki. It's called Guy's Golden Touch, which means whatever is gold, Guy touches. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm excited for you to learn about his past, his journey, and his advice for 20-something. So without further ado, we're going to dive in. But before we do, I want to say thank you so much to our sponsors for this episode, Unstoppable Wallet and Stuvo. Unstoppable Wallet is the investor-focused asset management tool that puts privacy, open economy, and decentralization first. They launched in 2019, they have over 20,000 downloads, and they are the youngest wallet to be supported and recommended by Bitcoin.org. You can learn more about our friends at Unstoppable Wallet at unstoppable.money. And of course, Stuvo. Stuvo is an app that helps you earn to pay your bills. They connect you with short-term work opportunities and guide you with a powerful AI insight so you can always reach your financial goals. They also have a special debit card that rewards you for everyday purchases. You can head over to the Apple Store or Google Play to download Stuvo today. All right, let's jump in with Guy Kawasaki to hear about what he was doing in his 20s. So I love to, of course, start at the beginning. Um, I understand that you graduated from Stanford in 76, but your parents wanted you to be a doctor, lawyer, or a dentist. You chose the route of uh, getting a major in psychology. What is your advice for that 20-something that has so much pressure from their family, <laughs> peers, um, and, well, you know, but they have a plan for themselves? What's your advice to that 20-something? Well, to accurately tell the story. So I graduated in 1976 from Stanford. And I was, I, let me start all over. So I graduated from Stanford in 1976. And the following year, I entered law school at UC Davis. And I just hated law school. So I quit after a couple of weeks. And I thought that was going to be the end of the world. But my father basically shocked the hell out of me and said, listen, uh, you don't have to go to law school. Just you know, do something with your life by your mid-20s. And so, yeah, know, there's a lesson there that... Uh, Maybe your parents aren't as set on their expectations as you think. So, <laughs> and I have never regretted leaving law school, uh, not for one moment. And, and I have lots of thoughts about people in their 20s. Um, and we'll start off with the bad news, okay? Please. So, so <laughs> the bad news is I would make the case that the most helpful kind of advice you can get is from someone who's about two or three years older than you, mm -hmm. who has walked a path that you think you want to walk. That eliminates me because I am 67 years old. I'm at the end of my career. I'm not looking for another job. I, I'm married. I have four kids. My kids are older than most of the people listening to your podcast. <laughs> and so, you know, what do I really know about, the arc of your life for the next two or three years. Now, you could say that I'm 67, so I have some wisdom that can apply. But, you know, with that caveat that I'm in a very, very different place. And it was a long time ago that I was your age. And so things have changed. Uh, you know, back when I was in, tw in my 20s, this is the mid 70s, and you thought you were gonna work for one company for the rest of your life and mm -hmm. you know, get a nice retirement package. Well, guess what? Um, if you're in your 20s now, you're gonna work for 10 or 15 companies. You may not even remember your first few jobs. So that's a whole different world. And uh, you know, th there was no concept of virtual work uh, that you you lived close to where you work, you commuted every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different world. And so with all those caveats, um, I'll give you my advice. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think advice number one is that chillax about your first few jobs because mm -hmm. they are literally the first of several. It's the job that you take right after you graduate from school is not the job 
you're going to spend the rest of your life in. I mean, I would be amazed, astounded, really, if you take a job after you graduate college and 30, 40 years later, you retire from it. It just doesn't happen anymore. So what does that mean? That means chillax. That means you almost cannot take a bad first job. Mm -hmm. so, so let's take some extremes. So everybody thinks, oh, oh I want to thread the needle. I want to work for the next Google. And then by 25, I'll be worth $25 million because I was you know, employee number 10 of the next Google. And so that's the best case, right? Well, the odds of that, are hap the odds of that happening are almost zero. And even if it's, it does happen, let me tell you something, uh, being a, a you know, $25 million heir at 25, which sounds like a great idea. Sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it does sound awesome. But I'm, I'm telling you, one of the things you're going to figure out is, you know, you're going to look around and say, well, what do I do with the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. uh, what am I going to do? Start a foundation, start giving money away at 25? At 25, you got 40 more productive years in your life, maybe 50 more productive years. So what the hell are you going to do? You're going to what? Go live in Lake Tahoe and ski 200 days a year and what? Advise young companies about how to get lucky and work for the next Google. What the hell do you know? I mean, what context do you have? And you probably will be an insufferable asshole. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that's the good news. Now the bad news, let's say the opposite occurs. You go to work for Terranos. And Terranos implodes, CEO is indicted, you know, the whole <laughs> thing, just total wreckage. And, and it looks just horrible on your resume. I got to tell you, I would make the case that you would learn more working for Terranos and watch it implode and all the mistakes and the denial and the lying and, you know, all the stuff that happened. You'd learn more from that than stepping into something and it takes off and you start thinking you caused the great success of the next Google. Quite frankly, you were just dog shit lucky. And, you know, you, you jumped on a wave and it happened to be a tsunami. I don't think that's going to happen every time. So the bottom line is it doesn't matter about your first job. Overall, I think that's a lot of great <laughs> advice, Guy. I mean, I want to break down a few things for the listeners. Number okay. one, 20 somethings need to relax. Uh, we have so <laughs> much time. I agree. We have so much time. And I know that there's a lot of pressure on us from what we see on our phones and what this person's doing. And this TikToker just made a million dollars doing a dance, but you need to relax a little bit. We have so much time in these early years. This defining decade is about creating these experiences, trying different things. Um, and I also love your point on, um, you know, finding if you're looking to get into a new industry, if you're looking to find the answers, um, sometimes you need to go to someone that's only a few years older than you, uh, someone that has gone through a similar path that you really want for yourself. It's great hearing stories from amazing <laughs> people. I want to trade it for the world. And I think I, I'm fortunate to be able to speak with you and hear your experiences. But I agree that if you're looking for a specific advice about something that's happening today, you should probably look to someone yeah, a few like, years older. You know, I guarantee you Warren Buffett <laughs> can't tell you what to do. <laughs> that's a very good point. No so, one on the show has ever said that. So we're going to, we're going <laughs> to hold you to that. Thank no, you. No, but you know, everybody's, everybody wants, Oh, okay, Warren Buffett could be my, my mentor, right? Richard Branson could be my mentor or, I don't know, Tim Cook or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we can talk about what we think at 67 and 60 and all that. And, you know, what it is, what it was like in 1987. Very different than today. Not now. Yeah. So, so I, uh, uh, another thing I want to make very clear, unless you're, you know, you're trying to cut me off because you run no, out of time. No, please, no, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. I, you know, uh, please. You I, I will tell you that the, the concept, that you should find your passion and dedicate your life to it. Mm -hmm. It's total unequivocal bullshit because in your twenties, you haven't figured out your passion yet. Mm -hmm. and, and you may look around and say, Oh my God, you know, Jane, or Oh my God, Bill, they figured out their passion. They're loving it. They're working 60 hours a week, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, I'm 25. I haven't figured out my passion yet. Well, I didn't figure out my passion until about, see, 65 when I figured out I had a passion for podcasting. And I've had several passions through my life. But it, it takes a while to develop what is an interest into a passion. So the concept that it's like love at first sight 
And, you know, you wake up one day and you say, my passion is programming. My passion is marketing. My passion is sales. My passion is user interface design. It, it doesn't happen like that. And so what you should do is pursue interests. I'm interested in mm. programming. I'm interested in user interface. I'm interested in marketing. I'm interested in sales. I'm interested in blah, blah, blah. So you, you constantly pursue interests and God be with you. One day you may discover that it's beyond interest. It's an obsession. It is, in the words of the famous author who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F-U-C-K, mm -hmm. uh, he said what you should do is, what he recommends is, you know, you know you've discovered your calling when it involves shit sandwiches that not only do you not mind eating those shit sandwiches, you love to eat those shit sandwiches. Hmm. So in my case, podcasting. From the outside looking in, and you can probably truly understand this, from the outside looking in, podcasting looks like fun. You know, you contact these famous people, you press the record button, you press the record button again, and you upload it. You know, how hard could that be? Well, they don't realize what a shit sandwich podcasting is, how much editing it is, how much groveling it takes, how much scheduling. How many knows? How many yeah, knows? How many knows, <laughs> right. And even with the yes, when they accept, they tell you, you know, with two hours notice, I can't do it. You're going to move it later, right? <laughs> and so there's a lot of shit sandwiches involved in podcasting. But if podcasting is a shit sandwich that you love, you know, it's true. It's real. And so I guess I'm telling you that pursue a lot of things that interest you. When you find yourself willing and happy and loving shit sandwiches, you've discovered a passion. That's the test. I love the point on not spending your early 20s or even that, you know, defining decade searching for a passion, really find interest first, interest that you can obsess over, obsess to the point where when you have to deal with the shitty situations, it's still fun. Um, and then within that, you're able to find a passion. So that's very clear. Thank you so much for breaking that down, Guy. Um, <laughs> and I want to touch quickly on your time at Apple. I understand yeah. from your roommate at Stanford, uh, you got a job at Apple um, in the 80s. Your yeah. job there, even when you started, was you know really making developers interested in using the Macintosh, and that's yep. when you coined the term uh, being an evangelist. Well, um, you worked... I mean, <laughs> oh no, please, I mean, correct that's me. That's not if I'm... quite accurate. So, to be completely accurate, uh, someone named Mike Murray, who was the director of marketing of the Mac division, I believe, came up with the term uh, to apply to to what we did. Someone named Dave Evans years before mentioned the concept of evangelism, bringing the good news of Macintosh or Apple products. Mm -hmm. So those two people. And then, of course, even before that, there was Jesus. So there was Jesus, and then there was David Evans, and there was Mike Murray, and then there was Guy Kawasaki. So I'm, Guy like, the, Kawasaki. <laughs> I'm like the fourth or fifth coming. Yeah. Um, well, we could argue that you did it the best. Um, and clearly, I mean, eh. you know, people, you're, you're, people understand evangelism from you guys. So, I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm living proof. If you do one thing well in your career, you can coast for 40 years. <laughs> I love that. Um, hopefully I'll get there one day. Yeah, um, exactly. My, my That's quick, the goal. <laughs> my quick question for you with Apple. Uh, I mean, you worked for Steve Jobs, um, yep. of course, you know, at two different times. Um, and uh, something that you mentioned at a, during a TED Talk that I had an opportunity to watch a few days ago was um, something, a piece of advice that you got from him. Do not listen to experts. I'd love for you to kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and maybe within there, well, we can find uh, some advice for 20 somethings. Well, that, you know, talk about circling back. So I started <laughs> off by telling you not to listen to me and not to listen to people who are 67 years old. Well, guess what? You know, the world pretty much assumes that the 67 year old Warren Buffett, Guy Kawasaki, not that I'm equal to Warren Buffett, I'm just mentioning random names. Sure. Okay? You know, Richard Branson, Warren Buffett, Guy Kawasaki, Tim Cook. Well, he's not 67, but, you know, you think, okay, these people are quote unquote experts, right? Well, you know, <laughs> um, it's hard to separate expert from lucky sometimes. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, but we, we may be experts in a different time, in a different place, in a di different set of circumstances. And so, you know, theoretically, there was an expert who was the CEO of Kodak. Well, he couldn't embrace digital photography. Even though Kodak invented digital photography, he didn't embrace it. Oops. Um, there probably was an expert who was in charge of Blockbuster. Well, guess what? Nobody drives to Blockbuster to get DVDs anymore. And so 
these are brands that you never heard of because you're too young, but there was a typewriter company called Remington Rand, Smith Corona typewriters, mini computers. I mean, there are a lot of things that were run by very intelligent people, but they couldn't make the step to the next curve. And so that's the danger of listening mm -hmm. to experts, because if you ask someone who dominated the mini computer business, so, you know, I have a different idea. Instead of having a mini computer where the brains is central and terminals talk to the central brain, my idea is a personal computer. And these computers are so small, so cheap, so easy to use that you could even have one in your house. And then that expert would tell you, son or daughter, I don't know, would you call daughter? Son uh, or ma'am or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or probably you would say, honey. Uh, so, honey, nobody wants a computer in their house. They can drive back to their office. And then you wouldn't start Apple, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the danger with listening to experts. Yeah, no, I think that's very clear. Um, you know, especially if you have someone of stature that has like done amazing things for that given time period in a given industry, they might, you know, treat the world like they know everything. They have all the answers. Um, but something I've learned during the pandemic, especially, and I think a lot of people have seen this, we're all kind of figuring it out as we go. I mean, things are <laughs> no changing. <kidding. laughs> we, things are changing so fast. Um, and no one can really predict the future. People have gotten very lucky and made some wonderful guesses. Um, and of course, that's tied into their first principles. That's tied into the research they do. I mean, you, know, you get lucky, but no one can see directly into the future. So we're all still figuring it out. So I think that's really great. I mean, don't take well, advice from one person, that, especially one person that considers <laughs> themselves an expert. Diversify <laughs> the information that you take yes. in. Well, um, and also, you know, um, as they say, you know, a carpenter sees every problem as a nail, right? And every mm -hmm. solution as a hammer. So let's say that you started a mini computer business and you sold through a direct sales force without resellers. Okay. So you're the expert and you know how that works because you've been successful. Along comes Apple. So now you say, okay, Apple. That's what I did in the mini computer business. That's what you should do. You, you need to have your own sales force. You need to have your own stores. You need to have your, you know, whatever. Nobody mm -hmm. buys computers at retail, excuse me. So you need to have your own sales force calling on small business because that's what's worked for the mini computer business. But the personal computer business is very different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe it's mail order. Maybe it's your, your own dealerships in shopping centers but the person who's who's an expert in the mini computer business isn't thinking retail sales and so that's why though they may be rich and famous and successful and quote unquote an expert they may not be able to help you in fact they'll do you damage because mm -hmm. they're a they're a carpenter they see something sticking out they're gonna use a hammer I love that analogy. Um, and Guy, to close us out, um, you were the chief evangelist, obviously, at Canva, um, a program and um, application that I use often. I mean, for all of my podcast yeah. uh, content as well. Uh, to that 20-something, I mean, let's just pitch Canva to them. I mean, you know, I know you talk yeah. about Canva all day, everywhere, but, um, you know, let, let's kind of yeah. let's learn a little bit more well, about your day-to-day -day with Canva. Well, so Can I'm chief evangelist of Canva, and Canva is an online graphics design service. Basically, what Canva has done is democratize design. Mm -hmm. So in the old world, you bought or rented Photoshop. You spent weeks trying to figure it out. Canva, Canva's sort of design center is we figured out the common design types, presentation, social media graphics, flyers, business cards, infographics. We figured out there's several hundred of those, and we made several hundred templates for each design type. So if you want to make a presentation, you come to our presentation design type, and we have hundreds of presentations laid out for you. You change the text, you change the pictures, you're done. So what I like to tell people is that in the time it would take you to boot Photoshop, you could finish a graphic in Canva. So that's Canva, democratized, democratized design. Now, one more thing. I have a podcast called Remarkable People. And what Remarkable People is all about is my interviews with people like Jane Goodall, Steve Wozniak. Oh, I, I can just go on and on. Margaret Atwood, Christy Yamaguchi, Ronnie wow. Lott. Um, uh, oh, God, who's 
Angela Duckworth. See what happens when you talk to somebody 67? Angela Duckworth, <laughs> Bob Cialdini, David Ocker. Okay, I got them all. Scott Galloway. And so my, I'm on a mission to make people remarkable by listening to the wisdom of other remarkable people. I love that. I love how simple we put, um, you know, that is, I mean, just straight to the point. Those are the best podcasts, ones that you could literally explain in a sentence, um, because <laughs> yep. that helps, you know, guests understand what they're walking into and also listeners understand uh, before they check out an episode. So we're going to link that uh, to this episode to make Thank sure you. that our listeners check it out. Guy, uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, right. One of the most unique interviews I've had for sure. Um, <laughs> I love, I love your perspective. I, I loved it. And uh, I'm excited for people to check this out. Okay. All right. Take care. Awesome. Thank you, guy. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.